Hi, it's Scott Tempesta from Sailing Anarchy. We're doing another one of our retro boat videos. Today is a treat. There aren't very many of them. Say hello to the Santa Cruz 37. So for today's video, we're going to start off with a little information that some of the newer sailors that are watching these videos don't quite know. This boat is a ULDB. What's a ULDB, Scott? Ultralight Displacement Boat. What defines that? It's kind of a formula that goes into determining length, beam, weight, etc. This boat, 37 feet long, over 11 and a half feet wide only weighs 8,600 pounds. I mean, think about that compared to any other boat in this size range. There aren't very many this light and the Santa Cruz 37 was on that mission from the very jump. Let's talk a little bit about the back of the boat now that I'm here. Twin wheels, you don't often see these on a boat of this size, but one thing you'll notice about this boat is just how wide it is aft. I mean, it truly carries its beam aft. It only comes in a little bit at the transom, but it is a wide boat back here, so there is room for two wheels. I would probably think that most people would like to have a tiller that are gonna race this boat, but this is the way they did it. It's slick, it's nice. You can pretend like you're steering a 50-footer, but it's only 37 feet, but look at it. It's, it's clean and it's well done. When these boats were brand new, part of the idea with these things was to trail them, make these things trailer sailors. Not a lot of people are gonna trail sail their 37 foot boat. Like I said, it is 11.6 wide. That's problematic for trailering, I think. But they did two things that are way different than any other type of boat in this size range for sure. It came with a retractable rudder that you could pull up. So for trailering, you know, you didn't have the thing down there for any sort of ramp work. I don't think you would. I think you drop this in with a hoist. So it had a lifting rudder. The other thing it had, and we'll show you when we go down below, is it had a lifting keel so that you could lift the keel up, lift the rudder up, drop the boat down flat on a flatbed type of boat or whatever you have trailer, I suppose. Then you could trail the boat easily. You wouldn't want to trail a boat this big with a keel that's seven and a half feet down having it fixed. The boat would be way, way up in the air for trailering. This boat, they modified the two things. They put in a permanent rudder and got rid of the cassette added different uh, rudder bearings, and then they also made the keel fixed. They didn't have any use for the lifting keel, and they added a kelp cutter to this boat as well. One thing before we go forward and show you a little bit more of this boat. You'll notice that it's got this little hatch here. Oh, okay, that's pretty interesting. You open it up, there's the rudder head, which is really nice. You can access, uh, access the quadrant, it's all right here. But this was, I think, originally done so you could pull the rudder up. So again, the lifting rudder, lifting keel, that is absolutely what that has to be for. Well, people say I never leave the aft end of a boat anyway. And obviously I can't leave here yet because look at this. Voila! That's gotta be for life raft storage, I would think. Light air, no go if you're doing an offshore race, with, and that's what these guys are doing with this boat. You would never put the raft back here for maybe a breezy transpack, a breezy cabo, whatever. You'd probably stick the thing back here, close it right up, and you got your latch. There you go, a couple of compartments aft, and I'll show you two more up here. Designer Tim Kernan, who's a great guy, know him personally, he really designed this boat as a very efficient boat, and, and this is a section that I like to talk about in terms of how well these boats are done. So perfect place for the helmsman, right? This is clearly for him, foot rest here, the main sheet is double-ended and goes to two winches. So he's got the main sheet here. He's got the traveler right here. And he's got the backstay right here. So he really does control all the major go components for this boat that has a relatively large mainsail. It's very, very nice. You'll also notice the one thing it doesn't have, or I should say the two things it doesn't have. It doesn't have running backstays, which is, thank God. Nobody wants those, and none of the modern boats really truly have them if they do swept back spreaders. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, but this is really nice. And you could actually grab, you know, if you're trimming main and I think the helm's been sucking, oh, give me, give me that thing. And I'll grab the helm, crank your main, I'm barking orders, hacking all over the course, but that's just me. 
Let me show you two other compartments. It's hard to believe this boat has this. So we talked about the aft one. That's probably for the life raft. We talked about this for rudder access and quadrant access. Here's one forward. This is an interesting one. It's a pretty deep well with a lot of space under there. Now this one. Well, what the hell is this one? Access the motor right there. I think it's a Yanmar diesel. I mean, wow, that's pretty nice, right? Because a lot of these boats, it's just hard to access the motor to do anything on them at all. Right here, fuel tank right there. I mean, clean, efficient, well thought out. The boat's designed to race, of course, but when we go down below, you'll be shocked at what you see down there for a boat that's 8,600 pounds. So they put some nice little cockpit seats in here. That's great. If you go to lean back, these things don't go, the, the, the seat winch islands don't go up high enough. And so you can't really even just lay, lean back against there. I, I know they did this for aesthetics, I get it. It's a relatively boxy boat as it is and with a pretty big cabin house, tall that is. So I think they wanted to keep the boat streamlined, but I don't know, you couldn't have raised them like that much, no? Okay, let's talk a little bit about the hull on this boat. So it's relatively slab sided. I take that back. It's very slab sided. It's got a relatively wide waterline beam. Not too keen on it for light air, but for breeze, it's awesome. A couple of design cues on this boat that are really quite nice. So the boat's got reverse shear. Reichel Pew, I think, was probably the first designers who really incorporated that a lot. The Melgus 32, the Melgus 24, a lot of their bigger boats, they have reverse shear. Reverse shear is just simply this. This on a boat is called the shear line. And a lot of times they're just very straight. Sometimes they come up in the bow. This boat comes down in the transom. So that's called reverse shear down there. It, it's a way to sort of minimize weight and bulk back here and also give the boat kind of a really nice look, from, certainly from afar. They carry that same thing through on the cabin house, right? It's a relatively tall cabin house. I mean, it's nice and rounded, it looks great, but they did the same thing. They brought a reverse shear to the cabin house. You know, I, I think it looks good in concert from uh, afar, and certainly this alone looks good. If you're gonna have a, a big house, and this boat does, they did it really nicely in terms of integrating it into the boat. No square corners, it looks good. Oh, my window finish. Of course, look at this. Now that is a really nice window. I, I love how they did that. I love how they brought it up here for some of the control lines, but you know, it fits. This is sort of, Bruce Farr probably did the original windows like this. This was a theme where they would do long and relatively uh, narrow windows. It adds nicely to the boat, the, the, the tinted black contrasting with the white. Mwah! That's a nice look. Okay, so on this double spreader carbon rig with swept back spreaders, they move the, the shrouds all the way outboard. And you would because this is not an overlapping Genoa boat, no tracks. Here is the track for the, the head sails on the boat. It's got a barber hauler line here, nice adjustment athwartship as well. Now, one of the things you'll notice is there's no chain plates. They hid the chain plates. A lot of times on some of these boats, they'll simply bolt the chain plate right here. And yes, it's very solid, but you know, you've got a big stainless thing there and it's sort of, you know, it doesn't look that smooth. Here they, they did eliminated that, dropped it down below. And when we go down below, I'll show you how nicely they hid uh, the chain plates on this boat. Now we're gonna go forward on the boat. It's not much up here. Four deck hatch for takedowns and a little uh, ventilation down below. Nice and smooth. They rolled all the edges here nicely, so nothing really to trip on. And we come up here to the anchor locker, right? No, it's not an anchor locker. It's oddly enough where the prod is. So this boat, you'll notice, it's got a prod, right? Right here, nice, nice thing, bolted on. This, by the way, this is all new, completely re-engineered. Brad Fitzgerald did a lot of the work on this boat in terms of what they did here, what they did with the keel, and then also the whole rudder system. It, like I mentioned, is completely different. So it's got a prod and it's got a sprit. And the, so look at this. And that's it. <laughs> so, if it was my boat, I'd probably have that go, honest to God, 
at least another six feet. This thing's a downwind boat, right? It's light. You want this thing to have as much sail area as you can, given the whole characteristics of the boat. Flat transom, nice and wide back there, tons of stability. The boat can carry a big kite. I, I, I don't know if they did that for rating purposes. I don't really know, uh, but man, oh man, I would have stuck it out there longer if it was mine. Uh, but I'll show you some of the compromises they made on this boat to have an interior that is absolutely deluxe. So you won't see this very often. And I think it also depends upon what rating system they're, they're going under. So when they're racing uh, PHRF and downwind races, they probably use the big sprit. When they're doing ORR races and uh, also PHRF buoy stuff, they probably just fly off of there. I could be wrong in terms of that, but they get, the boat has sort of a duplicity up here that is, um, it's different. Oh, and of course this, this thing has huge masthead kites. So, you know, there's never enough spinnaker uh, sail area ever in the world. So I would stick that thing uh, uh, quite a bit longer, but let's go down below and I'll show you why they did not. Okay, we're down below the Santa Cruz 37. Before I forget, Notice the window treatment inside the boat, right? Outside it's just one window, but inside they put a nice little frame around it and they divided it. And they could have easily done that on the outside, sands the frame. They could have split the windows into two. It's a personal preference. I think the one long window outside looks great, but notice how different the window treatment is inside. Just a little thing that makes the boat a little nicer down below, I think. So people often look for the holy grail boat, right? That is a boat that does everything that they want it to do. It's really hard to find boats in almost all form except pure race boats. There's some compromising and everybody has an idea of what they want in a boat, right? You want to go buoy racing. You want to go cruising. You want to just go day sailing and hanging out. This boat does a lot of things, but really what its focal point on a holy grail would be is offshore. This is a boat that's designed to go downwind and downwind fast. As I said, it's only 8,600 pounds. I mean, that's a light boat. And with all the sailor that it's got, the whole characteristics, the stability in the back of the boat, this is a great boat for Transpac. In fact, this boat has done Transpac three times. The first two, not very successful. And the third time it won its class in Transpac. And that's pretty hard to do and pretty impressive. So if you're looking for a Holy Grail boat, that's going to be relatively small, 37 feet is relatively small, a boat that's quick in a breeze downwind, especially that's designed to go fast and that kind of stuff, that has enough accommodations inside. That's the holy grail of this boat. So what would you compare this boat to if you're looking for a boat like that? The boat that comes to mind is the Express 37, which we've done a retro video on, and you can check that out on our playlist. This is just a modern interpretation of that. It's got you know different things on it. For sure, it started off with different features, the lifting keel, lifting rudder. Um, price point on this boat, that's important to a lot of people too. Uh, if you look on the used market, I mean, I've seen them, there aren't many. 140 to 170 or so thousand dollars. It's gonna be more than an Express 37, but it's a more modern boat. It's got higher tech materials. And I think it's safe to say that it's finished off more. So that would be what you would compare to if you're looking for the holy grail for a boat like this. So when I was on deck, I talked about the chain plates, right? How they're hidden. They're not strapped to the side of the hull. They put them in here and they're, again, nicely hidden away. Nobody really wants to look at stainless stuff down here or maybe they're carbon. I don't know. I suggest they're stainless. But they put this nice little thing here. Now, no doubt this pops right off if you need to access them, make sure they're not leaking, whatever the situation might, might be. But another touch, another nice design cue uh, purely for aesthetics and it works pretty nicely on this boat. So as we walk through the main saloon, um, it's got two nice settee berths here. It's got a pipe berth ability there and you've got your full nav station right here. And this is really well done and super comfortable. I mean, you got your chart here, you got your keyboard to work all your instruments, your full electronic panel right here, access to some of the wires and the brains. They don't let me touch that stuff ever. Wow, you can't ask for a better place to be for a navigator on a 37 foot boat. Like, okay. The galley, small, compact. What else does it need to be? 
infection sink. Ice box with a cold plate in there. That's really nice. Got your little mandatory stove here. And listen, you're going to need this. This is what you cook on when you're going to Hawaii. You don't cook much. A lot of freeze-dried stuff, but there it is. Uh, you'll notice their cocktail selection on this particular boat. They've got Mount Gay Rum and Lysol. That's called the f*** you, I think. It's a technical term for that drink. Back here, look at this huge double berth. I mean, it's amazing. A legitimate double berth. Oh, you'll notice one thing back here also. The obligatory kelp stick, God damn it! And so, you gotta get the kelp off the rudder. You gotta drag this thing up there. And like I said, nobody wants to do that, but it has to be done. So if we go over here and check this out, aha, look at this. We lift this up and there's another access to the motor. Now, one thing that's interesting here is they've drawn where the components are. So they've got a water maker there and they've got, you know, all the things that you do to adjust anything just written right here and just in basic terms. But again, a nice way to access the motor from here and a really good way to access the water maker, assuming you know what to do with it. I don't. Okay, and while we're here, let's show you a couple of features on this boat that are pretty unique. I talked about the lifting keel, so I don't know if you can hear me hit this, but that's really solid carbon fiber. They modified this boat, they eliminated the lifting keel feature, and they made the boat a fixed keel down there, and they did a lot of structural engineering here. Like I mentioned, Brad Fitzgerald helped with that, and so that is why this is partly raised and and then if you had a lifting keel it would go up even higher so that you could lift the keel all the way up and dare i say probably right through there to get that seven and a half foot keel all the way up in the boat so that you could trailer it uh, this boat has a kelp cutter but if you look a normal boat it probably has it right around here now you have to look for the kelp cutter on this boat so you open this up and reach in here and this here is the kelp cutter. And I pull that thing up, and of course they're always sticky, but you pull it up to the top, and then you bang it all the way back down there, trying not to break it. And they never do. But that's how the kelp cutter works, and that's where it's stowed. It's pretty trick if you think about it. So you see one thing here on the boat that is really different. So there's a door here, okay? And there should be a, a door there. There's not. Clearly this boat's cheating. They're taking the insides of the boat out and not reporting it. I'm kidding. So keeping in mind the idea of having this boat be something more than a full racer. So if you open this door, that takes you to the head. If you want to close the head, there's another little folding door that closes the head off that way. And this is only for people that want to go up to the four peak and that would typically be the owner right so you walk up here there would be a door that opens up and you're in here to the four peak of the boat it's a really nice area and i want to show you bits of the boat up here here we are on the four peak of this boat and i don't think it's a stretch to call it the owner's stateroom i mean it really is it's got its own hanging locker right here for your dresses uh, you've got a nice little changing seat here, I suppose, right? And then you've got your own access to the bathroom. We talked about the twin doors, right? So you can close the head off here so that any of your riffraff crew that wants to come use it, they don't see you up here and you and your lovely girlfriend or whomever boyfriend, you know, in Justin's case. And so it's roomy and it's really wide up here. You'll notice that it's a little short up there because that is the bulkhead. You can call it a crash bulkhead because it sort of is, it's watertight, but that is where the sprit exists. That short little sprit we talked about. If you did a proper sprit on this boat, you'd punch a hole in that bulkhead. I guess it wouldn't be watertight, would it? But you would have the sprit come along here and probably end right about here. So that you got a nice, I don't know what's that, at least six, eight feet of, of sprit that you could use. The problem is it's not pretty. The problem is it's probably going to leak a little water, so you just tell your person to move over that way. In fact, you go down below any J-boat, any nice J-boat, and you will see that they have the same thing. They've done it a little nicer, tried to hide it away a little bit, but that's what they did on this boat, leaving a really nice V-berth. As I said, the really nice enclosed head with privacy on a 37-foot boat, please. And then it's got this nice area right here as well. Finished off smoothly. They did this part of the boat really well. 
It's also worth mentioning that this is not the Santa Cruz yachts that you thought of in the past. The 27, the 33, the 40, the 50, the 52, and the 70. That was a totally different company uh, that was started and run by Bill Lee, who designed Merlin and started really, it was a grassroots part of the whole ULDB movement. Uh, once Santa Cruz yachts went out of business. They Unfortunately, the Santa Cruz 52 was the last boat that they built. We're going to do a retro tour on the Santa Cruz 52, but this was another company. A guy from Texas bought it, uh, took the company in a, in a new direction, but not completely unfamiliar, right? This is still a light boat, just a modern interpretation drawn by Tim Kernan. I'm afraid that the boat was a little spendy when it started. I think the boat in 2008, the base was around 230, and that's before you start putting all the goodies on and all the sales on so you probably had a $350,000 uh, 37 foot in 2008 mm, I don't know and the boats weren't rocket ships out of the box they just weren't great they were good but not great and I think the boat was a little bit of a disappointment in that in that regard they had plans to build a Santa Cruz 47 also designed by Tim Kernan it went nowhere and the company ultimately folded, which is kind of too bad. So earlier I talked about the holy grail aspect of this boat, right? What are the factors that this boat would have would lead you to think that's my holy grail boat. I forgot to talk about the ratings. So PHRF is what we mostly all race under. The two other rules, there's the ORR and the uh, ORC. I'm not getting into that today. Um, but this boat has three ratings. It's in Southern California, for sure, we sail under three different PHRF ratings. We sail under buoy, we sail under random leg, which should be any reaching type of course, and then we sail under downwind ratings as well. This boat rates 36 for buoy, it rates 30 for random leg, and it rates 27 for downwind. And those are probably on the harsh side for Southern California, I don't know that this boat can really sail to that. In fact, I'm pretty sure I, it, it can't. No diss to the owner or the way the boat is sailed. I just think the ratings are harsh. And anytime you try to get rating relief from PHRF, at least here in San Diego, good luck. It does indicate that the boat is faster downwind, which it is. And if you're looking for a boat that'll do that, that's the rating that you're gonna get, or ratings, I should say that you're gonna get with the Santa Cruz 37. So that's our tour of the Santa Cruz 37, a unique boat. It's really fun to go through all the features that make this boat what it is. It's a well thought out boat, a well built boat. If you like this video, then hit the like button. What are you doing? And if you wanna subscribe, in fact, it's not that you want to subscribe, you actually need to subscribe, you know you need it. So hit that button as well. For Sailing Anarchy, that's me. For Nobleman Production, that's them. We're out of here.